All right, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study on Thursday nights. We're going through the Bible. We're currently in this amazing book of Isaiah, and tonight we are going to, Lord willing, uh, finish chapter 48. We finished chapter 47 last week, so uh, if you're not already there, we'll invite you to turn there. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. If you would, please join with me. We'll ask God to bless our Bible study tonight. Really looking forward to what God has for us. Father in heaven, thank you so, so, so much for this time, this place, your word. We really look forward to it, Lord, <laughs> especially nowadays with everything that's going on. This place, this time on Thursday nights together in your word is a, it's a respite, it's a solace, it's a sanctuary, really for us. It's that time that we can just come together and put all of the stresses of our lives to the side and just focus our attention on you as you quiet our hearts so that we can hear you speak in that still small voice. And Lord, I know that tonight is no exception especially for those who are really struggling, of which I know there are so many. Just so much is happening and it's getting very intense and the heat is really getting turned up. And Lord, it's just <laughs> as only you can. You have us in a place here in your word that speaks to, I mean precisely, where we're at in our lives today. And only you can do that. And that's because your word is alive. It's living, it's active, it's sharp, sharper than two, any two-edged sword. And so Lord, we're just so thankful to you for your word and that which you have for us tonight here in your word. So Lord speak. We want to give you our undivided attention as you do. We want to have ears to hear. So Lord speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus name, Amen and Amen. All right, well as I mentioned before we went live, I mean, I know I say this every week, but really looking forward to this chapter as with every chapter I know, but I mean it's just so apropos to where we're at. Because in the chapter before us tonight, God, through the prophet Isaiah, He's going to turn a corner of sorts from this prophecy of judgment on Babylon to His plan for and His mercy on His people. And specifically as it relates to using Babylon to refine and purify them in the furnace of affliction. He's going to allow Babylon to be the instrument in his hands, perhaps better said the furnace in his hands, to refine and purify his people. This is really the takeaway from the chapter. And it really speaks to how it is and why it is that oftentimes God will deem it necessary to allow the fiery trials in our lives, the furnace of affliction. And as we're about to see, God in His grace his mercy and His love, we'll see this towards the end of the chapter, uses this furnace of affliction, those times of trials and testings, because ultimately it's for our good and perhaps more importantly for His glory, for His namesake. In fact, He's going to say as much as again we're about to see. So you ready? Let's jump in. Verse 1. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and have come forth 
from the wellsprings of Judah, who, listen very carefully, swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. For, verse 2, they call themselves after the holy city and lean on the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. Wow, what a, what a way to start the chapter. You know what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah here? He's basically, and it's very convicting actually, he's saying, you profess to know me. You profess the name of the Lord, but your walk doesn't match your talk. And, and notice, this is very interesting, right out of the shoot, and we're going to see it again a second time, but he starts off, listen, listen up, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of, not Jacob, Israel. Now why would God inspire the prophet Isaiah to pen these words this way? Here's a thought. You are Jacob, heel snatcher, uh, con man, conniving con man. That's what Yahob, Jacob means. Because the name is the nature. But you don't identify by the name of Jacob. You're called by my name, the name of Israel, which means almost the polar opposite. It means governed or ruled by God. In other words, you claim the name of the Lord, but there's a hypocrisy a duplicity, because you're known by my name. You profess my name, but your walk does not match your talk. And by the way, this is going to be the reason for the very affliction that God allows on His people at the hands of Babylon. Verse 3, I have declared from the former things, from the beginning, they went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass because, verse 4, I knew that you were obstinate and your neck was an iron sinew, and your brow bronze. That's pretty hardened. Even from the beginning, verse 5, I have declared it to you before it came to pass. I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, my idol has done them, and my carved image, and my molded image, have commanded them. Oh really? Oh, wow, that is, you talk about brazen and bold and brash and arrogant and obstinate. What a smack in the face of God. You're giving your carved images and your idols credit for that which God did? Big mistake. And this is one of those places where we better be careful in our own lives, because if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, we're very quick to come down hard on the Israelites. How, how could they do that? If God did that, and they have the audacity to say, no, it was the idols, our idols, our gods, our graven images, they're the ones that did it. Oh really? It's like, this is even more convicting, it's like despite God providing indisputable evidence, prophesying the end from the beginning, and notice how he says it, he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, and then 
I'm going to make it happen. But you're so obstinate. You will look me in the face, so to speak, and have the audacity to say, no, you didn't do that. My idol has done that. My carved image has done that. Now, lest we again think more highly of ourselves than we ought and fancy ourselves being more godly as to never do that. Let's think about that for a moment. How many times has God done something that only He can do? And not only has He done it, He did it in such a way so that it is unmistakable indisputable, irrefutable. And yet we, like them then, do the same thing now, and we say, we did it. Not God. We take the credit for it. Well, God's going to have something to say about that, as we're about to see. You have heard, verse 6, see all this, and you will not declare it. I have made you hear new things from this time, even hidden things, and you did not know them. They are created now, verse 7, and not from the beginning, and before this day you have not heard them, lest you should say, of course I knew them. Oh my goodness, this just gets worse. You know what, you know what he's saying? It's like, I, I, I do this because I'm God, and I, and I told you I was going to do it before I did it, so when I did it, you would know that it was me that did it. And what's your response? Oh, you fall down on your face and just praise God, and thank you, God, and wow, what a, oh, glory to God. And no, you say, no, I knew, I knew it. I knew it. It's... I hope nobody comes to mind when I say this, but isn't that what the know-it-all does? Who wants to be around a know-it-all? They know everything. You can't tell them anything. I know. I knew that. I know. <laughs> yeah, apparently I've got an issue with this, but you get the point, right? That's what they're doing. Here's God. I mean, He, he declares it. He does it, and they're like, yeah, I, kn I, kn I knew, I knew, I knew that. I, knew that. <laughs> I better stop. I'm going to need to repent. Verse 8, surely you did not hear. Surely you did not know. Surely from long ago your ear was not open. For I knew that you would deal very treacherously, and were called a transgressor from the womb. Boom. <laughs> That's a, I think they call that a mic drop. It's like God saying, I, I knew that would be your response. I knew that, and, I, and I'll tell you why I knew that, because <laughs> you were born that way. We were all born sinners from the womb. And it's again almost like God is saying, you know, I know what you're going to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. And the way I'm going to do it, I'm not just going to do it. It's not that I'm going to do it. It's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in such a way that there's no way that you could ever say, yeah, I know. No, you didn't. Who do you think you are? Are you placing yourself on a level playing field with God Almighty? That is the height of arrogance. Verse 9. Now this is where it gets very interesting. For my namesake, I will defer my anger. Translate it, I'm not doing this for you. 
I'm going to back off, I'm going to hold off, I'm going to defer my anger, I'm, but I'm not going to do that for you. I'm doing it for my name's sake. And for my praise, I will restrain it from you so that, get this, I do not cut you off. Oh wow. You know, you know what God's saying here through the prophet Isaiah, right? He's saying, if I didn't defer my anger, and if I didn't restrain it, I would just end it. I would end you. I would cut you off. I would just kill you. That's the anger of God. Not the anger of man, the anger of God. Now what's important here, before we move on to verse 11, he's going to say it again. He's doing it for his own namesake. Because see, God's name is on the line. And if the name is the nature, and it is, then this is what God is saying. It is my character that is at stake here. So if I just wipe you out, and take you out, and cut you off, then that's on me. That's going to reflect on me. So it's for that reason I'm not going to do it. So you can take a deep breath now. <laughs> uh, and don't pat yourself on the back, because that's the only reason I'm doing it. And he says it again, verse 11, for my own sake. And he says it twice, for my own sake. I will do it. For how should, listen, my name be profaned, and I will not give my glory to another. Okay. Hang in there with me. There's a couple things here that I think we would do well to take note of. The word profane, I think, is largely misunderstood. To profane something means to make it common. So you've taken my name and you've profaned it. You know, we, it does come from the word profane, profanity. But what God is saying here is, you're going to take my name and drag it through the mud, and in so doing, you're going to profane it. And I'm not going to let that happen. Because it's my name that is at stake. It's for my own sake, my name's sake, and no one is going to get the glory. Now this is going to be very important as we're going to see as we move forward. But this is the reason why God will allow those trials the furnace of affliction. It's always for His glory, first and foremost. It's for our good, yes, but it is always, ultimately, for God's glory. It's for the glory of God, because no flesh is going to glory in His presence. In the end, God will receive all of the glory. Now, there's another part to this that I think I want to try to tackle now, and it's kind of interesting because we're going to, Lord willing, be talking about this on Sunday in the Prophecy Update as it relates to those fiery trials and, and how God desires to refine us in that furnace of affliction. That's verse 10. By the way, did I miss verse 10? I did. Oh, that's the whole thing of the whole chapter. Wow, that's what happens when you don't have AC. Verse 10, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. Behold, I mean, I'm looking at my notes going, wait a minute, where, oh, I missed it. Behold, verse 10, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you, in the furnace of affliction, for my own sake. For my own sake. That's where he says it twice. Okay, now this is the why, and I know this might sound cliche, but the furnace of affliction, those fiery trials, will either make us better or bitter. 
Again, I know that's cliche. It's like, as one said it, the sun's heat can either harden or soften. It depends upon which that heat comes upon. And so you're going through this very difficult time, and it has the potential to either soften your heart or harden your heart. And it does seem, and it would appear, that it was the case for the Israelites, because he's lamenting, for lack of a better word, in verse 10, that I, I tried to refine you, but it was not as silver, because the silversmith will use the furnace to refine the silver. I tried refining you in this furnace, but it's almost like I was unsuccessful, because that fiery furnace that was meant to refine you as silver did not make you better. It seems to have made you bitter. It has not made you softer, it has seemed to make you harder. The same fire can either purify or consume. And I think so true too, is this true in our lives when it comes to those trials? We misunderstand, maybe better said, we misinterpret the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, even the chastising of God, as we talked about last week, and we'll see again when we're in Hebrews. But we misinterpret it, we misunderstand it, and when we do that, then we go to the other end, and we become hardened in our hearts. Because instead of saying, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this furnace of affliction? Our question rather is instead, why are you putting me in the furnace of affliction? That's the wrong question. You cannot give a right answer to a wrong question. The question isn't, why are you allowing this? It's, God, what are you doing in this? What do you want me to see in this? Obviously, you've got me in this furnace of affliction for a reason. You're trying to soften me. You're trying to better me. You're trying to mold me and make me and fashion me and into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. It's the refining, purifying process, like with the gold, as Peter refers to. The goldsmith will subject that gold to intense heat, that furnace. And then all of the impurities in that gold will rise to the surface. And then the goldsmith scrapes off the dross, and he knows he's got pure gold. Same for silver when he can see his image reflected in the gold. Do you see the connection there? That's the purpose. God is all about making us more like Jesus, molding us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. Romans 8.28 and 8.29. For we know that God works all things together for the good, to them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Well, what's His purpose? Verse 29, His purpose is to make you more like Jesus. And if He's got to use the furnace of affliction to do it, guess what? Furnace of affliction it is. It's not because He's mad at you. No, it's because of His love for you. It's not what He's doing to you, it's what He's doing in you. It's often been said that God cannot do a work through us until He first does that work in us. So there's the furnace of affliction. <laughs> he sends us into those fiery trials. Not to punish us, I'll teach you a lesson. Next time you, you'll think twice about that. I'm going to throw you into the furnace of affliction. No, it's more like this. Uh, there's some things I've got to burn off of your life. There's some things that have taken up residence in your life that need to go. Because if you don't let me get that out of your life, it's going to end your life. That's why we allow surgeons to cut cancer out of our bodies. 
It's like, I better get it out before it takes me out. And the same thing is true in the spiritual sense. We can have things growing in our lives, and the only way to get them out is to burn them off, cut them out with that surgical double-edged that's so sharp it can cut between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and God ever so lovingly. Oh, it's a, here's a great example. I haven't used this in many, many years. Uh, my firstborn son, he was, uh, oh, he couldn't have been uh, more than one year of age, maybe uh, shy of two. But um, my wife calls me and, and she says, there's a, there's a lump on his stomach. And I mean, you know, of course, as parents, the, our first thought is, he's got a tumor, he's got cancer, he's got a tumor. We imagine the worst case scenario, right? Come on, you do that. <laughs> Don't look at me spiritually. You do. We imagine the worst, it's always the worst case scenario. No! So we take him in. Oh, very common. He's got a hernia. I'm like, a hernia? little toddlers get hernias? I guess so. This, this kid, yeah, I, I, he got a hernia. So can you believe that we let that doctor take a knife and cut into our baby boy? What? We're going to report you. <laughs> you, you what, sh- how, how would you, how could you ever do that? Oh, because there's something in there that needs to come out of there. In this case, it needed to be, it's a tear and we needed to, he was so active. They, they had a word for it. In fact, one time they said uh, to us, oh, you have one of them. We're like, one of what? <laughs> oh, they call them active alert active alert. Give me a break. (laughs) This is an active alert. We're way beyond active alert. But anyway, I mean active, yes. (laughs) Alert, absolutely. But um, they, they had, it was a tear and they had to, but they had to cut in there and, and do that for him. And that's what God has to do with us. He has to get in there. And sometimes he's got to get us in to that furnace. And, and isn't that what the potter does with the clay? Puts them in the furnace to refine them, because we're his workmanship. You know, as I mature in Christ and grow in grace, I'm learning. I, I cannot stand before you and say that I've learned. I think that would be disingenuous at best and dishonest at worst. But I'm learning in the process. I'm learning not to fight God during those times when I'm in the furnace of affliction. I've got re- reservations. I've got VIP status in that furnace, I'll have you know. I got reserved. I mean, that, that furnace has my name on it. I'm very familiar with this furnace of affliction. I've been there so many times. And it's like, oh no, okay Lord, can we just get this over with? Because see, what I do is I fight the Lord in the process, this refining process when I'm in the furnace. And all I'm doing is prolonging it. I'm making it worse for myself. One of the things the Lord's been really ministering to me in my time with Him, just the last couple of weeks, but more pronounced this week, is what I'm going to refer to as the after before. Now let me explain this. God has to remind me of the after before because I'm stressing so much before, and I forget that after, and God has to remind me after, and it's kind of like, why didn't I stress out and kick and fight and bite and scratch and scream? And all I did was I made it worse for myself. That was so unnecessary. Not only was it unnecessary to fight the Lord through this process, I actually ended up making it take longer. Ah, there he goes again. J.D., man, that, that guy, he just doesn't, you think you get it by now. I mean, here he is in the furnace and he's fighting it. Turn the heat up. 
And then you start feeling the heat turned up. You're like, okay, okay, God, okay, 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 I give, I give in, I give in. Well, it's about time. You could have saved yourself, spared yourself so much needless and unnecessary suffering had you just surrendered. I'm doing a work in you. You've heard it said that God will comfort the afflicted. But have you also heard it said that it goes the other way? God will afflict the comfortable? Well, well now wait a second. This is what we're going to be talking about on on Sunday. It's how it is and even why it is that the affliction will increase right before the deliverance. This is what's happening here too, by the way. We see it in the Exodus with the Israelites. It got, so remember when, and this is what we were talking about on Sunday, remember when, uh, so God calls Moses, says, go to Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses is like, okay, go, he goes to Pharaoh. This is pre-plague. He has no idea about plagues yet, okay. So Moses goes innocently believing, I believe naively so, that he was going to go to Pharaoh because God called him and he was going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh was going to just let him go. Mm, no, he doesn't let him go. In fact, this is what was his response. Uh, apparently, the Israelites have too much time on their hands to complain. And, and it, actually, he just asked for three days so they could go and, and make offerings. And God actually never told him, ask Pharaoh first, let's walk into this, Moses. Just ask for three days to start. No, that was Moses that that's a whole nother. So his response is, well, apparently you guys got too much time on your hands. You know what? Uh, we're not going to provide the straw anymore. We, you guys have had it too good. So you got to get your own straw, if you can even find any. Have you seen how bare the shelves are at the stores? There's no straw to, uh, right now. I'm <laughs> sorry. And, and not only that, but you still have to reach the same quota of bricks every day as you did when we provided you the straw. You know, it's interesting, archaeologically, they have found in some of the finds, the digs, that the bricks were, were better with more straw. And then as you got further up, the bricks in quality deteriorated with less straw. But I love it when archaeology proves the Bible. You know, when they find something archaeological, I'm going way off. I'll come back to our Bible study. Just give me a, a second here. But uh, I, you know, when they find something, okay, so they, there's this archaeological dig. What, what is this? What did we just find? I don't know. I know. Let's go to the Bible and find out what it is. And that's what they do. They just don't tell you. It just proves the Bible. Me down to the straw. Are you kidding me? I love it when God does that. It's exactly as we're told it happened in the Exodus. Now, why do I point that out? And why are we going to talk about this on Sunday? Because this is God's MO, if I can say it like that. He will increase the affliction because He's about to deliver His people. And the problem is, is that sometimes His people are too comfortable where they are. And the only way to get them to want to be delivered is to afflict them in their comfort. God afflicts the comfortable. They're too comfortable. Yeah, but they're in slavery. Yeah, but they've, that's all they've known. They've kind of settled in. And so, you know, I, I say it like this, and I, I know you know what I mean, I, at least I hope so, when I say that God has a problem. God doesn't have problems, but I'm using that as a figure of speech. God has this problem. We're the problem, but the problem is He's got to get us from point A to point B. How's He going to get us from point A to point B if we're too settled and too comfortable in point A? Oh, I know. <laughs> We need to um, ruffle the feathers in point A. We need to turn up the heat in point A. We need to allow the furnace of affliction in point A. 
We need to afflict the comfort in point A, because unless and until we do, they're not even thinking about point B. By the way, you know, that's why I'm standing behind this pulpit, as is my privilege to do. I would have never, I was, I mean, I hate to use this expression, but for lack of a better one, we had it made in the shade. The church was going, growing, glowing, living the dream, man. Everything was great. I would have never thought about leaving that church to another pastor and starting another church. That was the furthest thing from my mind, and that was the problem. So how's God going to get me to consider leaving to come here to start this church? Well, we got <laughs> we to turn up the heat, and boy did He. I mean, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> Maybe, uh, maybe I should consider B, point B. Ah, it's working. God put me through the furnace of affliction. He allowed those fiery trials. And boy, I'm standing here. This is uh, going on now, what, uh, 17 years? It, going on 18 years, actually. I can't even imagine where I would be right now, with the Lord especially, had He not done that. I, I'm learning, again learning, to thank God for the affliction. Because were it not for the affliction, whew, well David said as much. You know it, Psalm 119, that famous Psalm, verse 67. He actually says it twice. First time is in verse 67. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, now that you've afflicted me, I keep your word. Thank you, God, for the affliction. Forgive me, God, for fighting you. Forgive me, God, for even questioning you. Here I am in the furnace of affliction, and you're doing something so profound, so deep, so wonderful in my life, and I'm fighting you on it. I need affliction. He says it again, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. You know that expression, you can learn the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. It was an uncomfortable laugh. It was a nervous laugh, and I think I know why. Because, come on, how many of us learn the easy way? I would so much rather learn from your mistakes, so that I don't have to repeat them in my own life. But sometimes I have to learn. That's the only way I'll learn. The only way I'm going to learn is through that furnace of affliction. It's good. It's a good thing. Affliction's good. Don't fight it. God's doing something good. God has good. God's going to work it for the good. There's something He wants you to see in this. There's something He wants you to learn from this. He says, it was good for me to have been afflicted so that I could learn the lesson that you're wanting to teach me in the affliction. I wish I could learn. There was an easier way to learn. I wish I could, like, just, you know, some people have this ability, and I, I hate them. But anyway, <laughs> it's like, I mean, they can read something, and they get it. Not me. Oh, I struggled through school. I mean, there was this one kid, classmate, good friend, and I mean, straight A's, 4.0, valedictorian, the whole thing. And I, I remember asking him one time, I said, John, do you, do you study? Do you do homework? He said, no, I just got it. He says, I just, I just like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to get this thing, and my brain isn't wired that way, and I have to maybe go to that school. Oh, you've heard of it the school of hard knocks. No, because that's the only way I'm going to learn. 
Um, there's no such thing as a failure if it brings about success. In other words, it's a good thing to go through the affliction if you come out of it having learned a lesson from it. It is good for me to have been afflicted. Let me say one last thing, and then I don't want to uh, go too far into this, because again, we're going to talk about it on Sunday. But I truly believe that this is what God is doing in this world today. He is allowing this affliction, and it's on a global scale. And it's what we talked about last week as well. It's to get us to let go, because He's about to deliver us. With the Israelites, we're going to see it with the Israelites in Babylon here in a moment, but with the Israelites in the Exodus, I mean, they were born into that. That's all they knew. So can you imagine if Pharaoh would have just said, okay, Mo, I'll let him go. And he just lets him go. And then here's Moses going to the Israelites saying, okay, you guys, let's go. Where? Well, what if I don't want to? I mean, come on, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah, but we got to do the same quota of bricks now. That's pretty bad. Yeah, but go. Well, sounds like we need 10 plagues of affliction, and then they're going to want to go. And that's to me the why it is that God allowed all of that to happen the way it happened. By the time they got to that 10th plague, man, oh God, <laughs> take us out. I am. You ready? I am now. I wasn't before. It was good that you afflicted me. It was good that those plagues happened. It was good that we had to get our own straw. It was good. You can just keep filling in the blanks. It was good that this happened. Look how many people have come to Jesus Christ because of what's happening, and are even now as we speak. And we'll see them in heaven. And had it not been for this, it would have never happened. It takes affliction. That's just the way it is. I wish it wasn't, but it is. That's the way it is. Affliction, hardship, difficulty, pain, suffering. And we're going to see it now. Listen to me, verse 12, oh Jacob, and Israel, there it is again, my called, I am He, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. They stand to attention. All they have to do is speak the word. Well, what's this about? Well, <laughs> here God is reminding them of the reason for choosing and using the furnace of affliction to refine them, which is chiefly because of who He is and for the glory that is only His. Let me say the same thing in a different way. Listen, I'm allowing this. You listen to me, O Jacob and Israel. I'm allowing this. I'm doing this because I am God and I alone will be glorified. I am the God of the end from the beginning. I stretched out the heavens. I laid the foundation. And when I speak the word, they stand to attention. That's me. And you're identified and associated with me. You're called by my name. You profess my name. This is for my name and my glory, and I will do it. Verse 14, all of you, assemble yourselves and hear who among them has declared these things. The Lord, and I want you to catch this and hold on to this. We're going to come back to this. The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. 
I, verse 15, even I have spoken, yes, I have called him, I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Now, this speaks of Cyrus yet future. But what God is declaring here is that in the end, the furnace of affliction, everything he does, is ultimately motivated by his love for us. He does this because he loves me. This is not, again, God out of anger or vindictiveness punishing us. No, God loves us. In fact, I love you so much, I've got to do this. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. Remember as a parent, when your kids were little, you told them, I, I'm doing this because I love you. <laughs> to which my children would always say, I wish you would love me less. <laughs> or how about the one that's going to hurt me a lot more, it's going to hurt you. Well then why hurt yourself? <laughs> Just, you know, we could spare both of us this, you know, fate. No, I love you. I love you so much. I'm going to send a deliverer. I'm going to prophesy this through Isaiah 150 to 200 years before his parents are even born and even name him. I'm going to name him. His name is going to be Cyrus. And I'm going to prosper him in delivering you. But before I deliver you, I've got to turn the heat up in the furnace of affliction. So you'll want to be delivered. And we're going to see that next. Verse 16, come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. I was there. And now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. Whoa, that's the Trinity right there. Did you catch it? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. This is Jesus Himself who bursts into the text almost as if to introduce Himself and the Holy Spirit as Lord and Redeemer and the Holy Spirit, the Holy One of Israel that guides us in the way, notice, leads you by the way you should go. This is the way, walk ye in it. This is good between me and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is directing us, sometimes redirecting us, sometimes correcting us. Why? Because He loves us. Think about with your children, your grandchildren, how much you love them, and how hard it is sometimes when you have to correct them, redirect them, just even direct them, provide them with direction. It's hard. I've often said that I've started businesses, owned and operated businesses. I've planted and pastored two churches. But combined, it is not as difficult as parenting. And that's not hyperbole. I, 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 being a business owner, <laughs> being a pastor, does not compare with how hard it is to be a parent. I mean, it's the hardest job I've ever had, <laughs> being a parent. Because as a parent, you love, you never knew you could love so deeply. You love them so much, and it's so hard. And you have to provide them with direction. And here you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who are going to teach you to profit, bless, be prospered, and lead you by the way you should go. We have to provide our children direct direction, especially in this day especially with everything that's happening, how much more so our Heavenly Father. Oh, verse 18, that you had heeded my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. 
Your descendants also would have been like the sand and the offspring of your body, like the grains of the sand. His name would not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Here now is the heart of a loving, tender Heavenly Father. Tender, loving Heavenly Father. And it's almost like he's saying, oh, if you would have but obeyed me, the blessings that would have ensued in your life, and not just your life, your children and your grandchildren's life as well, if you would have but obeyed me, just taken heed to my word and walked in obedience, the peace that would have ensued would have flooded you like a river. The righteousness like the waves of the sea. And your descendants, I would have blessed and prospered you, but you tied the hands of my blessing with the ropes of your disobedience. You know what our problem is? We think that living an obedient Christian life is too hard. You know what's harder than being obedient? Being disobedient because of the consequences of disobedience. And by the way, as far as obedience is concerned, God will never command us to obey Him without also giving us the Holy Spirit in order to obey Him, because that's consistent with who God is. God's not going to command us. You know, His commands, John says, are not burdensome. God's not going to say, I command you, now get to it. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, He gives us the how of the Holy Spirit to obey the what of His Holy Word. He said, Here, I'm going to, I command you to do this. Now here's the Holy Spirit that's going to enable you and empower you to obey this command that I've commanded you. That's the, the nature of God. Because if you think about it, if He didn't do that, then He would be party to our disobedience, and that's impossible. God cannot tempt us to sin or evil. If God's going to command us, to, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, <laughs> the letter to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3, you obeyed my command to endure patiently. Now, I've read that and taught that jillions of times. And yes, Jillian's is a number. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, I knew it was, I, I, I know it said command, but it just, you know how it is when a very familiar passage of Scripture just, I mean, something leaps off the page. That's again the, the God's Word being alive and active. I mean, it just jumps off the page and slaps you in the face and goes, that was a command. He's commending them for obeying His command. What did He command them? He commanded them to endure patiently. Oh no, it's a command? No, that's a good thing. Why? Because if it's a command, then He's going to also give us the Holy Spirit so that we will obey the command. You almost want it to be a command. In fact, if it were a command, it would be like, God, can you make it a command so I can get the Holy Spirit, so that I can obey it? You want it to be a command. You obeyed my command to endure patiently. How did you obey? It's the how of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us and indwells us and empowers us to live a holy life. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the disciples, they were freaking out about Him, talking about dying and leaving them, and no, you know, why do you have to go? And He's like, no, don't worry, I have to go, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. You, in fact, you want me to go, because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Go forth, verse 20, from Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. 
Declare, proclaim this. Utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. And in the last verse, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. That's what I mean by a disobedient life is harder than an obedient life. Never think for a second that the wicked sleep well at night. Never think for a second that the wicked, the non-Christian, have it better than us. Never think or murmur or complain. We don't want to call it that. We want to sanctify. So we call it lament. Sounds very spiritual. We lament. That's what pastors say instead of complain, because complain is so carnal. So I, I was lamenting. You were complaining. Come on. Never complain about how hard it is to live the Christian life. The, the world, the non-Christian, and this should, this should solicit pity and sorrow in our hearts on their part. I, I feel so sorry. You know, we often say it like this, what do the non-Christians do? I mean, we, we've got the Lord. How do they do it? I mean, we go to the Lord. Well, they go to the bottle, whether it's a bottle of pills or a bottle of alcohol. I feel sorry for them. They have no peace. You think they sleep well at night? I mean, yeah, they, we, we see them shed in this favorable light, but you don't know what's going on in their lives. They live a tormented life. They have no peace. The peace that is ours as Christians, whew, the world knows nothing of it. They will never taste from that cup. Well, this is the declaration. Prophetically, Isaiah says of them to them, you're free. Go. God has set you free. He has sent Cyrus to deliver you from captivity in Babylon. You would think they would be already packed. Let's go. Oh, praise the Lord. What if I told you that there were some who did not leave? I don't know. What, were they too settled there? I think so. You see where I'm going with this? I'll close with this. This is again what we're going to talk about on Sunday. They got too settled. They're in slavery. And they didn't leave when God set them free. When God took them out of Babylon, they didn't want to go. I wonder, hmm, when the rapture happens, as quickly as it's going to be, in the twinkling of an eye, I just wonder, when God takes us out of this world, are there going to be some like them then, that are like, I really don't want to go. I got it too good down here. Things are just starting to get back to normal. <laughs> better not go there. <laughs> One last thing. I haven't shared this in a while too. I got suspended in high school. My friend and I, just, just something stupid, and almost got expelled, almost didn't graduate. I was so rebellious. I wasn't saved yet. I didn't get saved till 19 after I graduated. I'm not proud of this. I'm just sharing with you. I was a teacher's kid, and man, I just, I, I made the mistake one time of getting on the honor roll. I made sure it never happened again. That's how, like I said, I'm not proud of this. Anyway, we did this stupid thing. We stole these plastic cups, and 
you know, from the cafeteria, and then we got busted, and the principal was just a, you know, mm. he uh, basically said, you know, I, I'm going to consider expelling you, but you are suspended for one week. And, we, and he threatened graduation and the whole thing. And uh, boy, my, my dad was so, now I know as a father, oh, he was just so grieved, so grieved. He was old school. He would never really show the emotions, but I know that, that he probably wept. So when I got back from my suspension, I had this one teacher, not a Christian, pull me aside. And uh, she told me, she said, you know, there are, uh, and she'd been teaching for many years, she said, there are some kids that really don't want to graduate, because these are the glory years, man. I mean, they're the, you know, captain of the team, they're the cheerleader, they're the this, they're the that. And, and after all, they're, they're the ones, you know how you're told in high school, you enjoy high school, it's the best years of your life. I'm like, this is, the, this is as good as it gets? <laughs> really? It's, it's all downhill from here? Anyway, and I'm not going to go there either. But she said, you know, they, they don't want to graduate. And then when they do graduate, they're always living in the past. They still got their letterman jacket. They still got their, you know, class ring. They still got their, I mean, they're just living in the past. They never move on. And she said, I, I look at you and, and I know you don't want to be here. I'm like, are you? Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> she said, and I know it's hard for you, hard on you. That's clear. And yes, it is. <laughs> and she said, well, that's a good thing because you want out of here. Can you connect those dots? I think God is turning up the heat in this world on the affliction level, so that we'll want to get out of here. Because if things are so good down here, it's kind of like, yeah, Lord, come soon. No, when things are like they are now, it's, Lord, come quickly, come yesterday, if not yesterday, today, if not today, tomorrow, if not tomorrow, please, the next day, if not the next day, you, you got to come, Lord, because I don't know, it's really bad, it's really, really bad. You want to go. Ah, turn the heat up in the furnace of affliction. And so that when the declaration is made and the trumpet sounds, it's time to go. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm so out of here. Why don't you stand? We'll have the worship team come up. The furnace of affliction. Thank you, God, for the furnace of affliction. Thank you, God, for affliction. Lord, like David, I mean, we too would say and pray, it was good, it's good for us to be afflicted and for you to be the one doing the afflicting, because the afflicting is always that which precedes the deliverance. Lord, I truly believe with all my heart that you are afflicting us because you're about to take us out of this world. Like you took the Israelites out of Egypt, like you took the Israelites out of captivity in Babylon, you're going to take us, your church, out of this world. And we say and pray, Lord, come quickly. Maranatha, in Jesus' name, Amen.